everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, this morning, I'm speaking with Elton Robinson, who is the co-founder for Parents for Parents' Rights. You can find them at parentsrights.ca. Um, and I was hoping to have Elton on so we can start talking about uh, the Million March for Children that's going to be happening this Wednesday, um, the 20th of September. And then from there, we'll talk about um, the work Elton's doing with uh, parental rights. Hey, Elton, thank you for coming on. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I know I got a hold of you last minute, and thank you very much. It was, uh, you know, like I, I just got a hold of you last night, so thank you very much for coming on today to, uh, <laughs> to record with me. Thank you for the honor. Uh, so, I mentioned the the Million March for Children. So, yes, I've been seeing stuff uh, about it. Yeah, I've been seeing stuff about it. So, if you want to just talk about that, how it started, and you know, so it started like, back. In like, I think they started back in May and we're on back in June talking about this. Uh, it started with one group, uh, which is the hands off group, which is Camille and Behera. And then it kind of started an, or an organic movement where, uh, there's another lady named Dana Metcalf. Mm -hmm. Her site's www dot number one million March number four children dot com. Okay. Uh, she started a thing. Uh, through this, uh, we've been doing these uh, protests since our school board locked us out on the 20th of June in Windsor, Ontario, Greater Essex County District School Board. Uh, we were never approached. We had to kind of reach out to them. So there's a lot of organic groups doing the 20th too. It's not just one main group, although that one main group did pick the date of the September 20th. So we give them respect because they picked the date. Okay, yeah, no, that's, um, I was sorry, I just wanted to know because I was going to ask about that. So it's it's going on. It's not just in Windsor or Toronto. It's going on across all across Canada. Right? It's all across Canada. It's so it's it's so amazing. We did uh, something like this back on June 9th, uh, twenty twenty three, and uh, we had it in uh, small pockets across Canada. But uh, this one is turned into a beast. I think more and more people are aware because of New Brunswick's. Uh, uh, stance on parental involvement with their children with the secret policy and then Saskatchewan following suit and mainstream media is even picking this stuff up now and then in Ontario Doug Ford made an announcement uh, I think it was two weeks ago about this too so uh, this this movement's really picking up steam and the best thing is I think a lot of people are starting to ask questions that weren't really asking questions before because they weren't really aware that they lost their parental rights by a policy that's basically across every school board in Canada. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you mentioned New Brunswick and then like you know, yeah, Saskatchewan. Um, I hadn't seen Ford's message, so I'll, I'll look out for it. But I'll uh, send it to you. Yeah, I mean, you had um, like right after New Brunswick, you had Trudeau saying, well, the parental rights movement is a far right movement. I mean, I don't know. Wait. Like, Whatever else he does about uh, housing, immigration, whatever, all that stuff, right? if he's going to be attacking parents, I don't see that being as a winning strategy. Like I just that's like to me, that was weird. Like, you know, you've got these provincial premiers saying we want to give parents the rights to know what's going on within their children's lives, which I think is important and that it's obviously it should, should be given. And you've got the prime minister saying, no, that's a far right movement. So I mean, like he's kind of pitting himself against parents and so yeah so the whole thing with this policy that's the main focus when people it seems to be the biggest biggest thing people can rally around because they were totally unaware just like i was back in september last year that made me uh find some like-minded people to start this uh movement in windsor um so the policies structured around the safety of the 2s lgbtqia plus student right? Mm -hmm. Which I agree with. If you go back to school, like when I was in the nineties, it was horrible for those uh, individuals, right? I had a, a lot of friends that are that, right? Mm -hmm. But those people are now in their mid forties and fifties. And I think there's way more acceptance. So I don't know why this policy exists. So this is the way I explain the policy is so Bob's at school and Bob goes to his teacher and says, Hey, I think I'm Bobby Sue 
and I want to be referred to as Bobby Sue. So the teacher under the school board legislation, depending on what school board legislation is, most of them are regardless of age, like mine, that teacher for confidentiality reasons is what the union says, keeps that secret from parents. But the scope gets bigger here. So the teacher knows, the 30 students in the class know, the principal knows, the vice principal knows, and then they go to an assembly, all 500 people in that school know that Bob is Bobby Sue. So the confidentiality for the parents, I have no idea why this is. So I'll dig a little deeper on that one. So Bob has bad parents. Bob has abusive parents. Bob's house is by the corner store and a student walks by and says, Hey, Bobby Sue. And the dad's like, what's going on there? Right. This is after school now. Mm -hmm. And something happens to Bobby Sue. It's not because Bobby Sue is 2SLGBTQIA+. Bobby Sue is, has bad parents. So in my view of this, and the reason why I started this, is who protects Bobby Sue outside of school now that this confidential secret that 500 people know, but the parents don't know, right? For the protection of the child. How are you protecting the child? On professional development days when they're not at school? On the weekends when they're not at school? The summer when they're not at school. It's just, it's a broken policy. There needs, there's already a, there's already a mechanism in place in all school boards for marginalized children. And the kid's not marginalized again because the 2 LGBTQIA plus, the kid is marginalized because they have abusive parents. So this, this is flawed and they should, if the, if, if, if the child doesn't want to tell the, the parents the school board should reach out to CAS just like they would if they said, hey, my mom or dad haven't been home in like three days, or hey, my dad calls me this and does this, right? Teachers would mm. go to that mechanism and get a third party involved. My problem with, you know, the way you described it is pretty, I mean, actually very good, but like my problem with this is it's under the assumption that all parents are abusive. Oh, you 100%. Know? You know, so, I mean, that throws out, you know, innocent until proven guilty. You're starting off yes. with the assumption of guilt and you have to prove your innocence. So that, that's, you know, that's wrong right there. But yeah, And then if, yes. you go to, if you go to Pierre Barnes' site, uh, exposing uh, Soji123.com, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. if you go there, so they're painting houses just like you said, as all unsafe. In the same brush, they're painting all schools safe. If you go to that website, there's over 2,000 charged sexual misconduct issues in school and that's just sexual misconduct not not about abuse or anything else like that from teachers right that's just the sexual misconduct so that's why there has to be a third party put in place for this policy which already exists for any marginalized child i don't know why i can understand why they might from the perspective of looking at maybe their life experience with their parents Mm -hmm. But not all parents are like that. Like, I don't want my child ever to feel alone. I want to walk with my child. And yeah. I have to sign a permission slip for my child to get a picture taken or go on a field trip. But on a big life decision like this, they want to exclude the parents for some reason, which I totally don't understand. Okay, I'm going to play devil's advocate slightly. Yep. Like, very, very slightly. Like, in some respects like you said if the child says you know if you tell my dad i'm now bobby sue uh, or if you tell my parents you know there's gonna be serious repercussions at home blah 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 please don't say anything and then the teacher calls or the school calls you know child protective services or something okay i can accept that and maybe to some point i can accept a teacher saying all right why don't we talk about it We'll see, and then trying to dig in more with the student, and for that short period of time, keeping it a secret. But once you get into the you know the point of chest binders or hormone therapy or puberty blockers or seeing therapists and getting affirmation only care, like once you get into that part of it, that's when I'm. It's a hard note. Like I said, I. I I don't think schools should hide pronoun changes and all that like from kids. 
But if a kid comes up and says that to the teacher and says, if my parents find out it's going to be really serious at home, it's going to be really bad. I mean, at that point, I think the teacher might say, okay, let's speak to child protective services and tell, instead of telling your parents, I mean, the parents will find out because child protective services will do something about it. But, you know, like that's where I maybe agree with it. I don't know where you stand on something like that. That's where, so I've had this discussion, uh, and it is a good optic, but there has to be a time frame on that too, again, for the safety of my child that's going through this, right? So is it a 48 hour window, right? Yeah, okay. The, because the issue is, is once you, once you change your pronouns, okay, and I don't want to, again, this should be a, a family by family decision. It should not involve the school at all, right? So, mm -hmm. cause the fact is there are some parents that will, uh, just socially transition right away without getting facts. Right. Me, I want to walk with my child and make sure this is the right path that they want to do. Again, they're going to be the people that are going to lead it, but going back, sorry, I'm getting off a uh, topic here. Yeah, no, no worries, man. Going back to your, uh, to your thing. Yes. You know what? I, I can see that optic, but there's gotta be a time frame put on that. There's oh, gotta be, there's gotta be. Uh, this policy needs to be like an ad hoc committee is what they'll call it. Right. So they need an ad hoc committee of some doctors, some parents on both sides. Right. And, uh, and uh, people that are professional at this, right. To come up with a plan, just simply to paint all parents bad. It's just, we've already seen what happened with the residential schools. I compare it to this and 160 years from now, are we going to have huge repercussions of this because you see the amount of detransitioners that are that are starting to come out of the woodworks right so again some people might have a friend named julia malott she was a man now she's a woman she's had her yeah. top surgery bottom surgery um so the reality is is there are kids that are going to choose this path right and julia is a very great person you know what I mean? So that's what people got to get out of it because as soon as you start talking against this, they automatically label you a transphobe or a bigot or far right. Yeah. But I mean, that's okay. Like, again, I'm, I don't disagree with anything you said there. I don't think, you know, like I said, if, if the teacher wants to investigate it or whatever, it has to be for a, you know, a very specified length of time. It can't be indefinite because that's ridiculous. Um, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, another thing I worry about, though, it's just, um, like you mentioned, you started, you know, getting into this last year, but I look at this and it's, I've looked at it starting in about 2014, started digging into this stuff. Um, uh, yeah. So what's your thoughts then? Because there are people, amazing people like you that have, have, have been doing this for a while, but okay. So my, my thing with this game, uh, yes, the, the whole problem in the schools, those policies have to change, but you know, we both talked about getting like child protective services involved if there's you know the child talks about abuse at home and stuff like that and you know even that should be taken very seriously and but it should be looked at very carefully like you can't just oh yeah this is abuse of parents take the kid away right? like yeah it has to be taken oh no they have to repair yeah. i would hope again i don't know a lot because i haven't had a lot of involvement with child protection services yeah. but i would hope that they try to repair the family first right but here's here's my problem like this is where i see this whole huge problem and it's not just okay this is the policy in schools it's also so based on bill c4 based on legislation in ontario oh. and other provinces child protective services is also going to look at it as you're harming the child by not affirming the transition therefore we can take the child away from you right i mean that that you have that issue right now at child protective services as well you have yeah. that issue throughout the government. So this problem, um, I don't know if you've ever heard the term the long march through the institutions. No, but I can okay. I can visualize it. Okay, so <laughs> I'm living it, it, it. Was this, uh, it was this German philosopher, uh, Deutschke or something like that. He came up with this idea in the 60s, and this is from critical theory. And it goes on to say that they wanted to go through the institutions. They wanted to take the institutions over that produce the culture and that produce society in general. Um, so that was the problem. Um, now, the long march through the institutions, if you fast forward from the 60s 
up till now, the first people who had PhDs and masters, not in critical theory or not in um, postmodernism, but in like the humanities, like sociology or psychology um, or gender studies, or at that point, I think it was feminist studies. Um, like these kind of degrees, starting in the early 90s, they all got the intersectional lens. So once you get that intersectional lens, that's when you have the suppression matrix and, you know, this person's more oppressed than that, and then who's more yeah. who's oppressed, who's oppressor, get all that. These people started coming out by the end of the 90s with their, you know, master's and their PhDs. They started going into the workforce. Now, I'm not, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is whatever, like, you graduate with a master's or a PhD. Uh, you know, you can go back into academy. You get into things like HR or you get into social work. You get, you're like, oh, we need a social worker. You've got a master's in social work. We'll hire you. I mean, that's a normal thing to do, right? But you right. don't know how this person's, the view that they are using to judge all these problems. And then they'll hire more people that think like them. And, you know, they, you, you get hired, you move up the ranks, you start hiring other people. And the next thing you know, um, like all of HR in most organizations and in our government, everything is taken over by people like this who think like this. And then there's, uh, it's gone back into the academy. It goes, so teachers are being taught through colleges of education, administrators, principals, you know, all these people are being taught through those colleges of education. The colleges of education are full on woke, whatever you want to call it. They're, you know, yes. they, they've got that whole thing. Um, Universities are pumping out, you know, if you're coming out of the humanities, I'd lay, I'd give pretty good odds that you've got a woke lens on how you're looking at things. And you're going into the government, you're going into schools, you're going into all that. So it's, yeah, you need to fix schools. And we need, to, like, you know, I know that's, and I'm not trying, you know, like, I know that's what your movement is focused on. And I, have, you know, no, like, yes, we need people to focus on all this, but I'm saying you have to keep in mind that. That long march to the institutions, they're coming up pretty close to take a victory lap. Right? Like it's um, if you look at all the institutions and how corrupt they are, I mean, our justice system is doing justice, is doing sentencing based on race. Okay. It's 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 ludicrous. So there's a lot yes. of problems. And then kind of hitting a little bit closer to what you know your or like, you know, the parental rights and all that, but how this affects in schools, and this is the way I see it, and it's all this stuff has a very Calvinist feel towards it, especially the critical race theory stuff. Um, if you read it, like uh, the whole thing of whiteness and all that is, is, is very much similar to total depravity. Um, and the way I look at it is this: so you had the race stuff come in, you have, before you had the gender stuff. The race stuff was telling white kids that you're evil and an oppressor and you've always been oh. evil and oppressor. And, you know, even if you're a good white person, you're always going to have that, you know, original sin, right? You're never going to get around it. Um, so, you know, uh, you're always a Jacob, not an Esau. If I'm, if I'm getting that yes. analogy correct. Um, yes. You're in my cap. Yeah. Spot on. <laughs> but along comes gender. And if you are a you know, white boy or a white girl, you're always an oppressor. You're always oppressed. Doesn't matter how good you are now. You know, um, you're you're not gonna you're not gonna be safe. But if you are non-binary or if you're queer or if you're trans, you were always non-binary, or queer or trans. Therefore, you were always oppressed, and you are no longer a sinner. So it's. That's the way I see how it's, you know, I'm not taking away social media. I'm not taking away, like, you know, like all those other things that we're, the, the kids are getting this from. But in schools, you're taught that this is evil and sin, and this is your redemption path. And if you start that in kindergarten, you know, whatever, uh, I don't know if you want to give this to Aquinas or uh, Aristotle, but, you know, give me the child until he's seven and I'll show you the man. Like it's, you know, like it's, it's that. So that's my take on this. It's like, 
I'm looking at it from a very long perspective. I'm saying we've got a generational fight because you had a generation for this stuff to take over institutions. And what are you going to do with a generation of gender studies majors? Um, you know, and people with critical race theory backgrounds and like, I'm sorry, they're not fit for much purpose. You know, so the, like, that's, that's my view on all this. And it's, you know, that's why I'm like, we have to be really careful and really precise in what we're doing because we're everything that we're looking at and everything that was supposed to protect us is no longer protecting us. Um, I'll ramble for a little bit more and I'll go on. I'll give it back to you. Sorry. So Christopher yeah. Hitchens used to, Christopher Hitchens used to talk about um, a man for all seasons and uh, the play by Robert Bolt and in it, Robert uh, Thomas Moore is speaking to the, I don't know if he's like an inquisitor or something, but he's from the Church of England. This guy's name is Roper. And he says, you know, so Roper asks him, like, so you'd give the devil the, the benefit of the law? And Thomas Moore said, yes, I would. But, you know, you, Roper, you'd, you'd cut down the law to catch the devil. And Thomas Moore and Roper says, yeah, I'd burn every law in England if I could catch the devil. He says, well, wh what are you going to do? The devil turns around and faces you. Where are you going to hide? Like, all the laws are gone. That's what I see with this stuff. It has corrupted our institutions. It's corrupted the things that protect us. So when we do need civil liberties, we don't have anywhere to go. And, you know, we need that. That's a, there's a lot that needs to be fixed. And, you know, like I, I'm all for you for what you're doing. And I, I don't want to, you know, like I don't want to make it sound like I'm, uh, you know, trying to be negative on that, but I'm just saying, this has got to be a very, very cohesive, coordinated event, um, effort, and there's a lot of moving parts that need to be fixed. I, you know, that's my stand on all. You're a thousand percent right, and I have a couple points to go back on a lot of what you just said. And it's funny what you just said because I was talking to one of our teachers this morning because um, we're blessed to have a bunch of teachers that are mm -hmm. still our age, but uh, you know and I know and probably a lot of your listeners know that the new teachers coming in, it's not the teacher's fault. It's exactly what you said. So my first point is, and I'll go back to that conversation with the teacher after is. So when I got involved in this in September, uh, munis municipal elections were going on once I realized I was losing my rights to my kid. And I number one, my biggest issue with this was I was never notified of this fact. Mm -hmm. I still have yet to seen it. So it was implemented in uh, 2016, they're saying in the papers now, but 2021 was the version I seen that, that just passed with the updated part of uh, excluding parents. So through this municipal election prior, I never knew what a trustee was. I would have just assumed that they're a trustee, that they're doing what's best for the child and the families. Right. Because mm -hmm. when I think of a child, I think of a family automatically. Right. Now, I'm not naive because I've I've 23 years in uh, in uh, charities that focus around a marginalized child. I was raised as a single uh, parent household. So I like to pay back that uh, community. Right. Because those kids need some love. Right. So uh, anyways, uh, once I found out what a trustee was and the election was, I went out and found uh some trustees to run. Well, there's only one out of the four that were up for election in my ward, which you vote to. There's only one that thinks like us. And this person happened to be one of the first 50 uh, East Indians that were brought into Canada and dropped in Winnipeg way back when. And they're a professor at the University of Windsor. And he said exactly what you said. If you want to save Canada, you have to... Uh, you have to defund your universities. He goes, my, uh, my students and my, and my own family are coming to me and saying that the problem is now this was 50 of us, uh, Christians, uh, majority white. And, uh, he said this comment that his students and his family are coming to him and saying that the white man's evil. So you're spot right on to what you said, because I'll take his lived experience because can you imagine being the first 50 of that race? Can you imagine the uh, 
true uh, racism, bigotry, and stuff that they face. Uh, oh. My stack. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say it's, it's ridiculous. Like, it's... Oh. <laughs> So my second thing uh, was going back to that teacher. So you have the oppressed coin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, me personally, I'm at the top of the coin. I'm white. I'm a, I'm a Christian. Uh, I'm able-bodied. I'm a heterosexual. I have no rights. So uh, in the, in the, in, in, can you say that word intersexual uh, Inter coin, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the teacher conversation I had this morning was, did you ever notice that most of these trans kids, and when you go to these protests in Windsor, uh, the counter protesters are basically always white. So if you're a kid in school, you just want to fit in, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I had a parent call me back in November and uh, this was the Catholic school board, and they uh, had a, had an issue with their child. Uh, their child was saying, I don't fit in. All I see is mental health posters and rainbows everywhere. Where am I in this school, right? So this leads me back to the conversation today with the teacher uh, saying that about the white. So what I think an underlying issue is, too, is, is they don't really have any rights or any voice. But if they want to be one of the cool kids now... They have mm -hmm. to have something on the bottom of the coin, right? Now, again, that yeah. doesn't mean all these kids are that uh, because there is a percentage. But if you look at the spikes in Gen Z to uh, to that segment of society, it's just spiked through the roof, right? There has to be a and 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 I don't I like to find another word from issue because issue could be a hard word, especially to a counter person on mm -hmm. this side, but. There has to be an underlying issue to why the spike is there and why aren't we looking at this as a society all together? Uh, I have this conversation with teachers and then with this Million Man March, uh, I don't know if you've seen yet or not, but all the unions are meeting on Sunday across Canada to make signs and to counter protest. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, what you're saying about the uh, institutions as mm -hmm. far as what was the what the coin term you use there the, the long march through the, through, the yeah. long march through the institutions yes yeah, so you can see it uh when you're getting involved with this but for somebody just waking up to this it's just i cannot believe the amount of i call it corruption is just unreal just in a school board and then you start seeing the unions and everything else basically in my view radical activists have taken over all the key spots and all the key positions and then they use uh bullying tactics to keep people out unfortunately i'm trying i'm calling on my christian brothers because all i see is uh uh women standing up for this uh, parental side right but i'm calling people in unions that uh care about their families and care about canada that, that we grew up in they need to get back in those spots and i know it's going to be rough but if we don't do it, man, our next two generations, I, I just, uh, I don't have grandkids yet, but I, I couldn't even believe what it's going to be like for them in those next two generations if we don't start standing up and taking some of these radical activist spots back. So when you say radical activists have taken over, um, there's a thing got to look at, so too, is especially in the humanities, now it's coming into some of the STEM fields, like environmental sciences, like is a good example of sciences that were taken over by this. The idea was to create activist academics, not academics who became activists, not someone who studied geology or meteorology or something and said, there's something wrong. I'm going to, I'm going to become an activist for the environment based on my studies of science. And this is what I see, right? Like they're basing their activism based on their education. Now, they're not teaching people science per se. They're teaching them how to be an activist for science. Yeah. So you're being taught to be an activist, no matter what you're going through. You should be an activist first, then an academic. And so instead of your, your knowledge and your training informing your activism, your activism is now driving your education. And you're learning how to be a good activist 
for environmental issues. You're learning how to be a good activist for uh, race issues or, you know, trans issues or whatever. You're not learning the facts of the issues. You're learning how to be an activist. So unfortunately, your degree might say, you know, master's in environmental science, but it might as well just say master's in, you know, environmental science activism because that's what it is spot on um so this march that you guys are doing on wednesday uh what is i mean you know that you mentioned the unions are going to do it but are you hoping that schools realize like that okay parents do have a right that you know we want to pull kids from some of these classes um, or do you want, you know, obviously want to change your policy, but, you know, what are you hoping will come out of it? Or do you hope that even more parents will start joining, um, your groups? Bingo. Uh, so when I started this, uh, my first board meeting at the school board was me and four other people, five people in September, 2022. And I thought, man, am I in the wrong <laughs> right here? Am I, am I missing something? Right. But as, as time went on, uh, ending in September 20th, we had 450 people with us, right? So we're hoping, I'm hoping out of this March, uh, number one, that nothing bad happens uh, out of hate, true hate, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that uh, people are, are, are going to wake up and say, hey, what's this all about? Because now my neighbor that I know is not far right is being labeled in the paper as a far right person. Right. I'm hoping that that starts some conversations for people to dig in. And once you show them some things, it's amazing how fast they switch in a, in a, in a light dings in their head. Right. Because again, we're all, we have to work, pay taxes, raise our families. Right. The mm -hmm. last thing you really want to do is be at a school board meeting for somebody that you've elected thinking you they have your rights in place. So with this Million Man March, yes, that's uh, what I'm hoping to do. And we've had a lot more new people reach out to us and find out about us. I've actually got more positives than negatives throughout this whole thing too. Since September, I've been in the media locally and uh, I'm in sales. So I travel around a lot of different places and I'm in the grocery store and people say, hey, I see you in the news. And I'm like, uh oh, but I have yet had one person say when they said that, say anything bad they say hey man keep up doing the good work or they ask for more information and they and then they get engaged right so i think there's more of us than them but it's not a fight mentality and that's what i wish they would understand it's not a fight it's a it's a a movement to try to find a center for all children and all canadians yeah i mean look so I always talk about overcorrections. I don't like it because I see them coming and they're they're not good. And like I said, we're, we've taken away our defenses. So when you do share, start having overcorrections, you don't, you, you're not really ready for it. But just to give an example, everyone's like, okay, Gen Z, they don't like this stuff. They're opposed to it. So, okay, yeah, we see as, you know, Gen Z will be fine at everything. But I'm like, okay, let's look at Gen Z for a second. One, even if they don't agree with this stuff, the way they're being taught, they're having you know issues with depression, all that, like anxiety. It's, they've got that. Second, there are a few polls that have come out, um, like 65% and plus have talked about agreeing to having cameras at home so everything can be monitored all the time. Um, there, is, there is an authoritarian bent in Gen Z. But again, look at what how they're being taught. They're being taught in schools. If you see something, say something. Schools have hotlines to report, you know, uh, microaggressions and all this other garbage. Um, so it's, yeah, they're, you know, they're they're not agreeing with a lot of this, you know, gender stuff or the race stuff. They're they're getting sick of it. Fine, but the way they're being taught the way they're being taught to look at the world and they might disagree with how they're using that view or those tactics, but then they could go apply them to, you know, things they want to do. Like if you look at 
extremely far right and extremely far left. And I mean, left, right doesn't mean much anymore. Like, yeah, their tactics are very similar. Like oh, fundamentalist and totalitarians have very, very similar tactics. So that's why I try not to get into oh, this is Marxism, this is Maoism. Like I, I respect the people from you know people who left China and say comparing it to Mao. Uh, I, I, I can compare the tactics and I can compare how it works. But this is its own thing. It's doing something slightly different. You know, yes, it's using similar methods and it's using similar methods to what I see in fundamentalist Islam. It's using similar methods to what I see in, you know, any fundamentalist faith. Uh, it's using it, what's going on in, you know, in, in totalitarian states like communist, you know, Marxist, uh, even fascist. It's so it, all of these things rhyme. So, you know, like, like I said, so you got to, so when these kids are being taught, that's the only way. When they're not taught how to think critically and how to evaluate information and how to, you know, they're just taught that, okay, this is how you look at the world and these are the tactics you use. I mean, like all these people, I, I, I again, just because I was watching this for a while and looking at it for a while, like all, all the red pills and like on, on Twitter, or on YouTube and stuff and talking about this stuff, they're all talking, okay, you got to read Saul Alinsky and you got to use his tactics it's against him. So I'm like, okay, you don't like the shit they're doing, but you're saying let's let's use that to fight against them. I mean, you're you're Boromir and Lord of the Rings saying let's use the ring to fight Sor uh, Sauron. I mean, you know, that, that's exactly what you're doing. It's just so it's two sides of the same coin. Yeah, and so I mean that that's what I'm saying. Like I I want to be really careful and I want to make sure that you're going back to like you said. Okay, we want to say Canada of the past or whatever, but it's like there are certain Enlightenment values that you know, quote unquote, Western civilization was built on. And let's go back to those values. And, you know, if you do that, then I think you will get back to a, um, you know, like around the mid nineties, where I think that was where everything was really starting to turn around for a lot of good. Mm -hmm. And then because of these people, like, like these degrees and the, you know, graduates with these studies coming out of universities, it all shifted backwards again. And it was, but like, so we, if we can get back to that and keep going on that path, I think we'd be a lot better off. Oh, hundred percent. I don't know how we messed this up as Gen X because it was all fixed. And you know what I mean? How can a generation of rage against the machine? Now we're, we are the machine, right? Okay. It's just uh, <laughs> okay. For, first of all, I mean, uh, Part of the problem with Gen X is the boomers have been sticking around so much longer. So it's like, you know, there is a problem with that. But also I used to joke that, you know, Gen X would be known about, we'd be known for our apathy if we cared enough. So it was just... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was the key all along, right? <laughs> just let live and be live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, but that, that, that's just it. But, it'd be, let, you know, live and let live became live like me or you're scum. Yeah. No, Which is know. wrong. Yes. Yeah. I Look, uh, I don't want to keep you here too much longer because I know you've got to get going, but I, I want to give you the last little bit to talk about you know, your group, and you mentioned you're making a coalition of groups. So yep. if you want to let people know where you can get hold of you, and if you send me all the links, I'll put them in the description. Okay. First thing I want to say is if there's any parents listening to this or grandparents or, or concerned citizens without children, because uh, I hear that sometimes too. People say they don't have any skin in the game. We all have skin in the game here because this is the future generation of Canada, right? Future generation of the world, if you want to go to bigger scope. Mm. But uh, please, please, if you have an issue with the education system, uh, parental rights system, please reach out to a parent group in your area. If you don't know where that is, we started a coalition. It's uh, Parents' Rights Coalition of Canada which has people like uh, you on there, sir, that have been fighting this for way longer than I have. And uh, I've been lucky to be brought into their team. And we're here to help you because if you go to the school boards, they try to silence you right away. And a lot of people get discouraged. I think that's a tactic that they use at the school board is to discourage you and think that you're the only person with this problem. So that website is www.pr coc.ca there's also forms on there if you are taking part of the 20th to fill out to send your mpp your principal and your teacher to let them know that uh you're standing up against this uh 
uh, radical identity theory stuff that's going on. There's also a, uh, a uh, letter there to fill out to send to your principal and MPP about in favor of Stephen Lecce's statement and uh, now Doug Ford's statement of letting parents uh, parent their children and the school board teach on teaching. Um, that's that site. My local site in Windsor is parentsrights.ca. Uh, we're a local group, but we also have a chapter now in Chatham-Kent. We also have a, chat, uh, a chapter in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. So if you are a, a lone parent or a parent group trying to that's just starting out, please reach out to us too. And uh, let's, get, let's win Canada back for everybody and for all sides because Canada is an inclusive thing. Oh, the last thing I didn't mention, in Windsor, we're going to be having Scott Nugent. For those people that don't know, Scott Nugent was the uh, trans man that uh, was on What is a Woman and uh, a, a very strong spokesperson for lived experience for what happens when uh, transition, medical transition goes wrong. Okay, cool. Great. Um, well, thank you very much, Alton. It was good talking to you. Uh, hope you have a lot of success on Wednesday. And yeah, I mean, I do hope that it is. Um, you know, because I've seen, I've been seeing some of the messaging going on about it. And everyone's saying like, to, "We're here to march. We're here to for our rights and to protect our kids." You know, you're not here to get violent. You're not here to get like, and it's so. Hopefully, it stays that way. Um, oh, but the other thing too is you don't have to join a march. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I, people are recommending bring children, and we will have children activities at our thing. So I'm not saying that we're not going to have children. But I would recommend that let children have their innocence. Even just keep them home from school that day is yeah. great. But if you could come in March and maybe have a safe spot for the child outside of this protest, because some of these counter protesters are pretty wild, uh, I would I would recommend that. That, that goes against hands off and uh, some other groups. But uh, that's my personal opinion that. Uh, to keep your children away from these events and let the adults do the adulting. No, for sure. I agree with you there. I don't like when either side does it. And it's just, yeah, it's not a good thing. Anyways, thanks a lot. Very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much again. And I will have this out later today. I'll send you the links and all that. Um, and if you have any social media that you want me to uh, put up, let me know, send it to me. I'll put it, uh, the links. Okay.